Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. Here we have taken important articles and the news clippings which has featured in the Hindu New Delhi edition. On your screen is the question for the day. Try to answer the question in the 250 words. The question is sourced from the DNS dated 28 March which was taken up by Shashank sir. Try to answer the question in the stipulated word limit and submit your answers on the e-learn platform of Rao's IS to get it evaluated from the expert evaluators at the Rao's IS study circle. Also there is an announcement for tomorrow. As tomorrow is the Eid, no DNS and DPP will be available for tomorrow. Moving on to the first topic of the day, the topic is featured on page 7 of the Hindu. Now this topic basically talks about the State Human Rights Commission which will soon visit to meet the victims till torture. Now the State Human Rights Commission will soon visit to meet the victims who have lost their teeth in the custody due to the alleged torture by suspended IPS officer Balbir Singh. The State Human Rights Commission member has also said that they have already started their inquiries and a number of victims have recorded their statement before the panel in Chennai. Now with the help of this article, we will try to understand what are the various ethical issues that are involved in a case of custodial torture. What basically are the ethical issues in custodial torture and what can be the possible way forward to avoid the situation of custodial torture. These can also be asked as a form of case study in your mains examination under the GS4 syllabus wherein it can be asked about the ethical issues that the custodial torture, how it represents the failure of the state and as a DM being posted in these districts or as a member of state human rights commission or general NGOs working in that areas, how can these be reduced? First, we'll try to understand the various ethical issues that are involved in the case and then we'll try to understand the way forward. The first ethical issue that this case represents is the denial to natural justice and the violation of the rule of law. Now, the criminal justice system should work on the principles of natural justice or the PNJ, which means every accused should be given a chance to defend him or herself before being pronounced guilty. But in this case, that is in the case of custodial torture, it highlights a clear cut violation and there is a compromise of opportunity that should be given to any accused to put forward his or her case. We also follow the criminal jurisprudence system wherein everyone is considered as innocent before proven guilty and thus the accused here are being denounced of their opportunity to defend themselves in case of custodial torture. The second ethical issue that this case highlights is the violation of human rights. Now, Custodial torture is a clear-cut violation of human rights or basically the rights as given under the UN Charter. Further, the custodial torture may sometimes result in custodial deaths and thus it is a clear-cut violation of the right to life which is promised under Article 21 of the Indian Constitution also. Thus, not only it is a clear-cut violation of the human rights but it is a violation and a travesty to the Indian constitution under article 21 which promises right to life to the people. The third ethical issue that this case highlights is that custodial torture basically goes against the principle of the social contract. Now the social contract theory as given by Thomas Hobbes and John Locke wherein it is protected that state is legally and morally binded, that is, it is a moral and legal obligation on the state to ensure the welfare of the subject. But in the case of custodial torture, it is the state through its machinery, in this case the police, it emerges as an oppressor rather than being an institution which promises the welfare of the people at large. The third ethical issue that this case highlights is that means are compromised for the ends. Now here means are compromised because custodial torture many times is seen as a method to ensure speedy delivery of justice or to ensure faster confession which may result in faster conviction. But the custodial torture does not ensure that one who is being tortured is actually guilty or not. Further, custodial torture is using unfair means 
to ensure ends and goes again the principles as propounded by Mahatma Gandhi wherein the means are compromised just for the ends further the custodial torture not only goes beyond the means and end debate but it also highlights that it goes against the due prosecution through judiciary further the custodial torture here also represents the misuse of authority now through the authority which is at disposable for the police to maintain law and order but it is used to ensure coercive means that is coercive and illegal methods are used to ensure or to collect evidence and thus the power is being misutilized by the police here further this case study also highlights erosion of trust in the judiciary meaning thereby in the garb of speedy justice and to ensure speedy confession and conviction police here fulfill the role of judiciary and this leads to erosion of trust not only in judiciary but also in the state itself because custodial torture may sometimes lead to cases of custodial deaths as it was seen in tamil nadu only wherein the father and the son duo had died in the police custody further the next ethical issue that is highlighted here is that it goes against aggrandizing the false role models in the society it can be a situation where the society starts celebrating these false role model or the false police officers which will ultimately lead to the creation of a wrong role model for the society a society which should ideally work on the principles of non violence and peace but the peace loving foundation of the society can be shaken if the society starts to align with the false role model the two more prominent reason or the ethical issues that this case highlight is the lack of emotional intelligence that is present among the public official now emotional intelligence is nothing but a control over the emotion that is to use reason and emotion together with together form the emotional intelligence but such custodial torture is basically a feeling that are generated due to the emotions of revenge or to teach a lesson or to demonstrate the power or to instill a fear of power thus this highlights that the public officials involved here are lacking emotional intelligence wherein they are not able to use the reason in their emotion and are guided by the pity emotions of revenge teaching a lesson or demonstrating the fear of authority or power and at the last the ethical issue that is highlighted here is the lack of good governance such custodial torture highlights that there is a general lack of good governance in the society and highlights the larger picture where the people are pushed towards criminal activities and this they are pushed towards criminal activities due to the absence of effective machinery of good governance and the failure of the state to ensure welfare of the people at large thus the people move towards crime so these are the ethical issues that the custodial torture highlights or this particular case highlights now that we have discussed the ethical issues that this particular case highlights we also need to suggest the way forward to avoid the issues of custodial torture now while answering any case study or while giving a solution for any problem in the ethics paper the easiest way to solve this question is to suggest the way keeping in mind all the stakeholders that are involved in the particular case study or that can be linked to the particular case study by keeping in mind the stakeholders that can be involved you can easily answer any of the question or case study now the stakeholders involved here basically are the accused which brings the rights of the accused the police personnel or the authority which brings the checks on the police personnel the role of judiciary which is also a stakeholder as the delay in justice prompts custodial torture to ensure faster confession that may result into speedier conviction and the role by the watchdogs of human rights that is the national human rights commission and the state human rights commission also of the role played by the civil society that is the ngos and the civil society at large so these are basically the stakeholders that are involved and that should be suggested in your answer as a way forward you need to include all these stakeholders in your answer to ensure that the that the answer is holistic now the first way forward here is the effective training of police personnel 
wherein the confessions are recorded without the need for a custodial torture apart from effective training of police personnel and use of scientific methods there is also a need for ethical training of police personnel so that there is a regard for the human dignity and the rule of law that is prevalent in the society there is also need to reduce the political interference in the profession of functioning of police so that to ensure that police personnel are not under any pressure from the political system of the day which may force them to use custodial torture to give faster results as sometimes politician may pressure the police official to ensure speedy justice now that we have addressed the police part we need to ensure that there is a proper role of judiciary so criminal justice system needs a reform which means to be needs smoother and fast to ensure that the delays are minimized by the establishment of special courts or any other type of mechanism for this purpose such that the delays are minimized the criminal justice system becomes smooth and thus the need for the custodial torture does not arise for the judiciary same court should take the sue motu cognizance of the various issues wherein the cases of custodial tortures should be taken upon by the courts as a matter of sue motu addressing the judiciary as a stakeholder only number of judges per lakh population should be increased as there is low judges to population ratio present which causes delays and to avoid these delays the judges or the vacancy in the judiciary should be increased so that the delays or the pendency is decreased and the need for the custodial torture are further removed now addressing the next stakeholder is the watchdogs of human rights that is the national human rights commission and the state human rights commission now national human rights commission should play an active role in the cases of custodial torture because it is the sole mandate for them to protect the human rights in the country and for this purpose the national human rights commission should be empowered or given more power so that they can take punitive action against the officials responsible for the custodial torture and at the last addressing the last stakeholder that is involved in the case is the role played by the civil society or the ngo at large and ngo should perform their duty because they form the civil society and civil society play a prominent role as a carrier of democracy and if they fail to raise their concern against the cruelty that has been meted by the state or the state agencies then their relevance is in question so the civil society as a collective group should take cognizance of these issues and ensure that these cases are not repeated so with this case we have seen what is the case of custodial torture in tamil nadu what were the ethical issues involved in the case and what can be the way forward that can be presented for the same and to answer such question how the stakeholders which are involved in the case should be included in suggesting the way forward this will make answer writing simpler while attempting such questions moving on to the next article of the day which has featured on page 18 of the hindu basically talks about the issues related to the steel industry in india now the article mentions that the as per the reports of steel outlook moving on to moving on to the next article of the day which has featured on page 18 of the hindu now through this article we'll try to understand the importance of steel industry in india we'll try to understand how steel industry from the very beginning has grown till today what is the contribution of steel industries in the indian growth and we will also try to analyze the demand for the steel industry and how it has been growing continuously apart from that at the very end we'll also try to understand apart from the issue of raw material what are the other challenges that the steel industry in india will face this topic is important not only from the economic perspective as under gs3 syllabus but also from the general studies one syllabus where it talks about the factors responsible for the location of primary secondary and tertiary sector industries in india and the world and upsc in the previous year has also asked a question related to the present location of iron and steel industries so we need to understand the contribution of steel industry in india now india after very independence adopted the model of mixed economy wherein there was focus on simultaneous development of primary secondary 
and tertiary sectors and this simultaneous development was necessary to achieve the developmental goal and for this reason steel was given due preference steel industry is important for india or for any other country in the world due to its extensive usage in various complex industries that deal with the various elements for the steel is very important because it forms a critical input of various industries due to its nature having immense strength low weight durability and the ductility and indian economic growth today has rested on the growth of this sector now that we have seen that the steel has extensive usage this is also testified by the fact that the consumption of steel in india has increased from 6.5 million tons in the year of 1968 to the current rate of 98.7 million tons in 2018 so this highlight the multi dimensional use of steel in india and this brings us to the question that what has been the journey of steel industry in india from the very beginning now if we analyze the journey the journey starts from 1875 with the setup of bengal iron and steel company later in 1907 tata iron and steel company that is tisco was established the steel journey continued with the steel corporation of bengal and post independence with the completion of major iron and steel plant in durgapur bhilai and roorkela now these plants were completed with the help of foreign countries also and this was the phase wherein the focus was on heavy industrialization which was state controlled and the belief in the theory of trickle down effect later in 1973 a new model of managing steel was introduced in the parliament this was because of the multi dimensional role of steel in various industries and this finally culminated into the setting up of sale that is steel authority of india limited the final boost to steel industry in india came with the lpg reforms that is the liberalization privatization and globalization reforms that were introduced as a part of imf conditionalities or guidelines in 1991 wherein the government of india liberalized the steel sector by removing iron and steel industries from the reserve list and within 15 years india was able to become one of the top 10 steel producers of the world today india has reached the level wherein india has become the second largest producer of crude steel in the world now this brings us to the question that we have analyzed the journey of steel industry in india that what is the contribution of steel industry in the indian gdp and today steel industry contributes slightly about 2% to the indian gdp further not only it contributes the gdp but it is also important because it employs more than 5 lakh people directly or indirectly that is within the steel industry all the ancillary activities related to them now the steel industry is also important because of the multiplier effect that it generates now this multiplier effect is generated not only in the field of economy where it generates a multiplier effect of 1.4 times but also in the field of employment generation wherein it generates a multiplier effect of 6.8 times and it is in this regard it is said that for every two job that is created in the steel industries 13 jobs are created in the supporting industry or through the supply chain thus we can see the multiplier effect in the employment field of the steel industry wherein the two jobs created in the steel industry further created 13 indirect jobs in the supply chain and we have seen that india has emerged as the second largest producer of crude steel today now if we see the chart analyzing the crude steel production in india the production has gradually increased post the 1991 lpg reforms wherein the sector was liberalized and dereserved from the government control and the output has continuously increased from the level of 17 million tons to the level of 111 million tons in 2018 19 and highlighting a gradual growth in this sector now if we 
we see the trend analysis not only the it has been a growth in the steel production in india post the reforms the sector specific contribution has also been noted and we have seen that a steel has a multiplier effect in economic generation as majority of the steel that is 62% of the demand of steel comes from the construction sector which is one of the largest employer or one of the largest labor intensive industry both globally and particularly in india furthermore steel industry is important because it helps in generation of capital goods or capital goods generation wherein a majority of 15% goes for the capital good generation in india and also supports critical industries like that of automobiles which further creates job in the ancillary fields so this we can conclude that the steel industry in india has been contributing not only through its own generation of employment or contribution to the economy but also through ancillary activities and this is the reason that the steel industry the production in the recent year has surged by 75% but it is also represented that a developing nation like india the demand of steel has increased by 80% at the same time and in this regard government of india introduced the national steel policy in 2017 wherein it further anticipates the per capita steel consumption to further increase to a level of 160 kg then this brings us to the last part of our discussion that despite of such a meaningful contribution by the steel industry in india then what are the current challenges that the steel industry apart from the availability of raw material face so the challenges that the steel industry in india will face are multi pronged and are related to finance logistics taxation raw material as have already been mentioned the article and the outlook report and that related to the energy and environment consumption we'll try to understand each of these challenge that the steel industry in india faces today one by one the steel industry in india faces the problem of first that is finance now the problem of finance is not limited to the steel industry but to the industries in general but becomes more pronounced for steel industry in india or for steel industry because of the capital intensive nature of this steel industry it is estimated that an investment of 7000 crore rupees is required to set up a plant of steel production of 1 million ton when it comes through the green field route thus the cost of financing and expansion in india basically comes from the borrowing by the banks or any other multilateral institution now when the majority of business of setting up of these industries is done through borrowing it becomes cost sensitive and the finance in india is extremely high that is the financing cost in india is extremely high when it is compared to the cost of financing in countries like that of china japan etc who are also the major producer of steel around the world further another thing which affects apart from finance is the cyclical demand in the steel industry now due to the cyclical nature of demand in the steel industry the investments that are made in the boom phase a downturn or the return on investment gets eroded when the demand plunges thus due to the cyclical nature of demand of steel industry and the capital intensive industry with high finance cost in india presents a major challenge the second major challenge of steel industry in india is that related to the logistics now indian steel makers face significant challenge in managing their logistical requirement the logistical requirement in india are expensive further the nature of steel industry also produces a cost on finances this is primarily because the nature of the raw material as well as the finished goods in case of steel industry as the raw material required is that of iron and coal both of which are bulk minerals and the finished good that is the steel is also a bulk commodity and thus the transportation of raw material as well as the finished good becomes a difficult cost further 
Though the railway is a preferred mode of transport for the steel industry or for any other industry due to their cost benefit, the infrastructure limitation that the railway puts in further increases the logistic cost for the steel industry in India, making them more expensive. The third problem that the steel industry in India faces is related to the tax, duties and the cis. Now, in case of steel industry in India, there are certain non-creditable taxes and cis which are paid by the steel sector. Now, due to this non-creditable taxes and the cis that are being paid by the steel sector in India, they reduce the competitiveness of Indian steel products and specifically reduce the export potential of steel products in the external markets. The next challenge as highlighted by the article also which will be very critical to the steel output in India is that of raw material. Now the production of steel in India will involve the raw material of cooking coal and India has insufficient reserves of cooking coal in India. Further, to increase the production of steel in India, India under its steel policy and in general relies on blast furnace method and this will necessitate the demand for cooking coal further. But India's reliance on the imports from Australia to meet the cooking coal demand which is subjected to the fluctuation of the global supply chains and the price unpredictability which will be generated through this hampers the growth of steel industry in India. And the last challenge that the steel industry in India faces is that of environment and the energy consumption. Now, the environmental concerns are taking a central stage not only in India but across the world or at the global level. And Indian steel industry is thus not immune to the cause of environment. Now, as we all know, that the steel industry is not only capital intensive but it is also energy intensive. It is energy intensive to a level that the industry is the second biggest consumer of energy globally and thus generates a large amount of carbon footprint and the environmental concern thus will hamper the growth of steel industry not only in India but also globally. So these are the challenges that the steel industry in India currently faces and are likely to face in the future. With this, we have seen the challenges. We have also discussed the contribution of steel industry towards employment generation and that of GDP growth. We have also analyzed the growth of steel industry from the very beginning starting from the inception in 1875. and. We have also analyzed how the production has continuously increased from 1968 level to that of 2018 and the major point and the turning point came in 1991 with the LPG reforms wherein the production has increased many a time. Moving on to the next article of the day, the article has featured on page 17 of the Hindu and basically talks about the organization of NATO or the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Now the article says that the Ukrainian president has asked for NATO to take the final decision to invite Ukraine to join the military alliance. Now moving on to at the beginning of the Russian and the Ukrainian war, the Ukrainian president has been asking the NATO for its inclusion under the alliance. And NATO has been in news from the past few weeks also because of the recent acceptance of Finland as the newest member addition to the NATO organization. Through this article, we will try to understand what basically NATO is. This area falls into the GS2 section under the international relation and basically talks about the international organization. Now this topic is prelim specific, that is NATO can be asked in the upcoming prelims examination. Now if you have seen the prelims 2022 paper, it is very clear that UPSC is now going a step beyond in the international relation and is asking questions which are much deeper rather than restricting themselves to the membership and the headquarters. Through this article, we'll try to understand what basically NATO is. And secondly, we'll also try to understand what is the expansion procedure of NATO. How Finland was added and how can Ukraine be added as a permanent member of the NATO organization. So first our discussion will involve around NATO. Now NATO is a military alliance 
of the countries from Europe and the North America. Now, being a military alliance of the countries of Europe and North America, it provides a link between the western countries of the two continents. The second thing to understand about NATO is that NATO membership is open to any European country which adheres to the principles of NATO and contributes to the security of the North Atlantic area. So this is one of the conditions wherein any European country can be added to the organization provided that it adheres to the principles of NATO and contributes to the security of the North Atlantic area. Now third important thing to understand about the NATO is the decision making process of NATO. Now NATO is a close knit military alliance and the decisions are reflective of the collective will meaning thereby the collective will is represented in the decisions of NATO as all the decisions of the NATO are taken by consensus. So the decisions of NATO are made through consensus and not through majority. Now the next thing to understand about NATO is that NATO's core task is of collective defense, crisis management and cooperative security and this is done through the principle of collective defense. We will try to understand what basically collective defense is. Now the principle of collective defense is enshrined under the article 5 of the Washington Treaty on which NATO is based. And this article 5 or the collective defense talks about that an attack on one or more than one countries of NATO members is to be considered as an attack against all. Basically, if any of the NATO member is attacked, then it will be considered as an attack on the NATO organization and all the countries will come together to defend the country who has been attacked. This principle of collective defense as we have discussed is enshrined under the article 5 of the Washington Treaty. Now this brings us to the question that whether this article has been invoked in the past or not. That is whether the principle of collective defense has been invoked in the past or not. Now NATO in the past has invoked article 5 and it was done for the first time in the history after the 9-11 terrorist attack on the United States. After that also NATO has taken collective defense measures on several occasions and a prominent example for that was a case involving the response to the situation that was prevalent in Syria. So this was basically about NATO. Now we have seen that NATO is a military alliance and takes decision on the consensus representing the collective will, how it works on the principle of collective defense as enshrined under the article 5 of the Washington Treaty. Now we will try to understand the expansion of NATO because this can be asked in the prelims examination as UPSC as we have discussed is now going a step further while asking question in the prelims examination. So the expansion of NATO is in news because Ukraine has been repeatedly demanding the inclusion into NATO. Apart from that, Finland has been granted the membership of NATO recently and with Finland, Sweden application is under process. So NATO has been in news for the past some time and it is very well expected that a question can be asked in the prelims examination. So the thing to understand here is the expansion of NATO and the expansion of NATO is possible as we have seen that it is open to any European country which adheres to the principles of NATO and contributes the security of North Atlantic area. And NATO here follows an open door policy. Now this open door policy of NATO is enshrined under article 10 of the founding treaty. And as we have seen that NATO is an organization which represents collective will. Any decision to invite a country to join the alliance is taken by the North Atlantic Council based on consensus again. Now the consensus is among the allies that is the already existing members. The already existing members decide on the consensus whether a country can be added to this organization or not. Now that we have seen that NATO follows an open door policy as under article 10 and the decision is, is taken by the consensus by the North Atlantic Council. This brings us to the next part of our discussion that what are the steps to the accession process. Now the NATO members collectively decide to invite a country to become a member. And after this an official invitation is sent and the country then begin the accession talks with NATO. That is after the decision to invite a country is taken, accession talks with the NATO begins. Then the second step that follows is that the accession talk takes place between the individual country that is the country to be included in the NATO 
and the NATO experts. So the second step is the accession talks. Now this is done at the NATO headquarters in Brussels. Now the third thing to understand here is that after the accession talks are proceeded, the invitees countries, for example, take Sweden. They then send the letters of intent to NATO, wherein they represent why there is a need for them to be included under NATO. And along with the letters of intent, they also submit a timetables for the completion of reforms that are necessary to be included under NATO. Now, these accession protocols are signed by the NATO countries, that is the member countries or the already existing members of the NATO. Apart from the signing, these accession protocols need to be ratified by the NATO countries. In case of Finland, Turkey was the last country that ratified this accession protocol and after which Finland was included in the NATO grouping. Meaning thereby, once these accession protocols are ratified, the invitee countries then become eligible to, to participate in the NATO meeting. But this participation as after this step is as status of non-member only. After this, the NATO Secretary General invites the potential new members. And after this invitation is sent, the invitee countries, for example, Finland, who has been invited by the Secretary General, will accede to the NATO in accordance with the national procedure of Finland. And once the Finland has decided to accede to NATO as per the national procedures, the country needs to deposit instrument of accession with the US State Department. And once this instrument of accession is deposited with the US State Department, the country then becomes the formal member of the NATO organization. So with this, we have seen the steps of accession process, wherein the NATO members collectively decide to send an invite to a country to become member, wherein the invitee countries then send a letter of intent to the NATO and the timetable for the completion of reforms so that they can be included in the organization. Accession protocols are first signed by the NATO members and they also need to be ratified by all the NATO members as we have seen in the case of Finland where Turkey ratified at the last. Now after the ratification of the accession protocols, the invitee countries are eligible to attend NATO meeting but still their status is of non-member. At the last, NATO Secretary General invites the potential member, that is the country which has been invited. They accede to the NATO as per the national procedure. And after their accession to the NATO as per their national procedure, they have to deposit the instrument of accession with the US State Department. And after the deposition of instrument of accession, they become a formal member of the NATO organization. So with this, we have seen what basically is NATO as an organization, on what principle it works, what is the open door policy of NATO, how the membership is expanded and we have also seen that recently Finland has been added as the newest member of the NATO organization. So now any question that is asked in the prelims examination about NATO and its expansion can be easily solved.